Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the City of Bettendorf Committee. The whole meeting today is September 20th, 2021. It's 5 o'clock. We have a few items on our agenda to get through, and then we're going to have a presentation on our uh, strategic planning goals and objectives for this year from our department heads. Uh, so we look forward to that. But we will start with item 7. This is the resolution approving the final plat of the cottages at the Heights submitted by Dan Dolan Holmes. For that, we welcome our community development director, Mark Hunt, and our engineer, Brent Morlock, is probably sitting up here, so maybe he's going to have some things to add as well. Yeah. Gentlemen, thank you for being here. Thanks, Your Honor. I will just uh, recap this case for you all uh, really briefly because we've, we've gone through a number of times, but it, it came through this case 21064. It's been through planning and zoning. Um, refresh your memory on the layout of the subdivision plot here. It's uh, a line near Kimberly Road and Lincoln Road. Uh, it's a one entry subdivision, 26 units, um, aimed at retirement age 55 plus, no age restriction. There is um, going to be a sidewalk in Berm in this location. Um, that'll be new sidewalk. There's no sidewalk there. There'll also be sidewalk to the north as well. Um, it's about a five and a half acre site. It, 26 single family attached townhomes. Future land use designation is urban low intensity. This is uh, compliant with that. Current zoning designation is R3 mixed residential. This would be a compliant use. The final plat complies with our zoning and subdivision ordinance. So it does uh, meet state statute and our local ordinance as well. And it does support uh, plan D of our comprehensive plan, housing options, uh, provide housing options and reinvest in existing neighborhoods. The utilities uh, are all in place. This is a fairly well-developed part of town. There is a lot A down in the southeast corner reserved for stormwater management. And I did mention the sidewalk. Uh, also, pedestrian access will be added at Lincoln Road. Uh, pedestrian buttons, those are not there at this time. Staff also took some, uh, some time between the last time you saw this, this project and today's date to evaluate uh, the feasibility of extending Middle Road to Kimberly Road. We have a drawing to show you, and uh, engineer, City Engineer Brent Morlock will help you. Yep. Thank you. What you'll see on the screen here, uh, to delay this the, the two weeks, we wanted to have uh, a third-party traffic engineer give us a feasibility look at potentially extending Middle Road out to uh, intersect with Kimberly and creating a new intersection there. Um, what you'll see is a feasibility graphic they put together. Um, what we'd be looking at doing if this... Uh, if this was to go forward in the future, uh, we'd be closing off the left turn lane that currently exists into uh, basically into the center of the Burlington Coat Factory into the development there. Um, you can see that on the south end. Um, to, we had to do that because that currently extends into, we'll call this quote unquote, the, the, the heart of the intersection there. Um, but there are access easements along all the driveways within that development. So we would actually just be shifting that up to the north at this new location. You can see there's a there's a proposed left turn lane there. Um, pedestrian accommodations work out well. We found nothing uh, while doing our due diligence that would keep us from uh, moving forward with this in the future if council does decide to. Um, I think our intent at this point was strictly to, to do a high level look at it. We've got some preliminary cost estimates. Those were a little higher, but the, the consultant that did this was doing short time frame. Um, you know, and really didn't go into any true design. We know we could scale back the, the pavement that they're showing all as new um, to get that number down, and it's something that we will plan to most likely bring forward during goal setting and CIP discussions here in you know, the next month or two. Yeah, Bill. Go ahead. Uh, Bill, go ahead. What's the <clears> – <throat> there's quite a gradient change from Middle Road to Kimberly Road there. How does that work out? Are you actually going to have cars that are stopped and starting on a slope? Uh, there will most likely be some slope to it. Yeah, we did not go into, we really didn't even look into to drainage. We just did, uh, for the most part, a two-dimensional to make sure that nothing in terms of turn lengths and um, turn radii. But uh, yeah, most likely you will have some there, if we did. That, that could be an issue, potentially. Yeah, and that to solve that, that may end up, that might have been uh, part of the reason that they had a little more pavement removal and replacement there was to try to change some of that grade. I know there that was uh, a little bit of the work on Middle Road if you look at <coughs> um, extending back and, and actually removing some of the existing and replacing it with new to help change that grade. Thank you. 
Yeah, great. South of Lincoln, are we still considering making that uh, two lane? We're, we're going to evaluate that once all of 74 is done. That'll uh, still work into this? Uh, we, we could, absolutely. Um, like I said, this is just real high level. Uh, we're, we have not really looked at anything beyond this. Uh, okay, okay. But we will plan to do traffic counts once 74 is all done, all the new ramps are open, and, and see what our volumes are, because I, I think we've talked to it. We think that they're going to most likely be lower. Okay, thank you. Mark, one other thing I wanted to add that was a question that came up uh, at planning and zoning. Uh, we had discussions with City of Davenport. Uh, if anybody watched the video, there was some concern that Lot B, which, can you go back? A small outlot on the west side um, of the subdivision ready to come in. Uh, it's about 10 foot wide. There's going to be some landscaping, some signage there. It originally included an access easement uh, as part of that. Um, we were trying to, from our staff level, leave it flexible potentially if, if that piece of property does ever to develop. Uh, I had a discussion with Davenport's engineer and their planning director, and they actually preferred that we not include that as an access easement. So that has been removed. So any access to that west parcel would have to come in north of there at this point, or they would have to come back and try to obtain some right away, at which point they'd have to go through us as well. Who owns, the, who owns that piece of property, Brent? Can I ask? <clears throat> yeah, that was the, the Rouse family. Okay. Um, I believe that house may have actually sold recently or was in the process I think was, we heard that was, was for sale I don't know if it sold I yet. think we heard that, that they were close to selling because the that was the property that there was the question about the well on that yes um, so that's that piece of property that two two and a half acres something like that and as is right now just single family one one home okay please proceed appreciate it so our, our recommended action is is the same as uh, the Preliminary plot, we have a positive staff recommendation. Um, this was approved 5-1 by the Planning and Zoning Commission at our last meeting, and we would recommend approval with the conditions that are outlined in the staff report. I'd be glad to answer any more questions. All right, any questions? Jerry, go ahead. Thank you, Your Honor. At uh, the pr preliminary plot meeting, uh, the developer made a uh, commitment to put in a fountain to uh, aerate the water in the, in the, in the pond. I don't see it on the drawings. Do we need to make a note on the drawings? At the that would be more at a site plan level. Um, I don't know that we could note that on the plat. I'd have to check with the city attorney if that would be something that would be noted on a plat. Uh, it'd be more. And this this project doesn't really have a site plan per se, but it would be more a condition of the development, not really on the plat. I just want to make sure it's not forgotten. So, understood. No, yeah, I. I it, it, from, from an engineering end, it definitely would not be something that we would actually put on the plat. Um, if you wanted to add it as a condition, I guess, for the, the staff report, I think you could, Jerry, you could probably make that motion at, to amend the, the recommended action to include that. I think we'd be fine with that from staff. It would be. Okay. Thank you. Other questions? Scott Webster. Is that where we need to put it then? Do we need a motion to actually <coughs> do that? If we do, then I'll, I'll make that motion that it's motion under the conditions for the. He, yeah, the developer so. agreed to it, so I'd make the motion. Second. Well, second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? There you have it. I don't know if there was a concern, but yeah. now you got it in your... your it, uh, it's, it, it was definitely a point that, that got brought up, and yeah. uh, Mr. Dolan was willing to, so I think it's a good idea to, to codify that and, and get it included. Other questions? All right, I'd like to entertain a motion that this remain as item seven to appear tomorrow evening. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? We'll take, up again, take it up again tomorrow night as item seven. Let's move to our consent agenda items, the first of which we're going to talk about is agenda item E. This is a resolution approving a site development plan for 3425 Glenbrook Circle South. Thanks, Your Honor. Case 2160 came through P&Z. Just give you a little bit of background. I know you saw it before last week in my absence, but here is that uh, site plan again. This is uh, for a multifamily use in the Glenbrook Circle or Glenbrook Subdivision. Um, kind of want to walk you through a little bit of, of what's 
gone on here. This was first platted as Glenbrook Ridge in 2017, the larger overall site, not just this site in particular. Second edition was created in 2019. That actually created the subject lot. It combined a few lots into that, that polygon shape you saw on the previous page. And then a third edition in 2020 um, created the eight acre, eight acre lot for the large senior living that's on the west side. Um, so kind of this is the stage. I think there was some confusion about where we were at in the, in the plats and the site plans and what's going on. Then, then there was a site plan also in 2020 on that eight acre site that um, required and maintained additionally that fire access that we spent so much time talking about last time. So uh, really belt and suspenders approach here. You have, you have plats, you have site plans um, that all have maintained the dual entrances north and south off of Devil's Glen Road, one a private and one a public access. Just a reminder, this is an urban medium intensity development character area or DCA. The 29 concept plan showed a mix of multifamily and single family. That's what you have here. Uh, the proposed use fits in with that general concept approved under the DCA, and it also supports uh, goal D, provide housing options and reinvest in existing neighborhoods. So you're fine. Um, stormwater detention is provided uh, adjacent in outlot two. And just a little bit of a reminder on that thoroughfare access. This is from the February 2019 staff report. It really just details uh, in a more eloquent way of saying you've got dual access. You should run that too. I do have a positive staff recommendation. It was approved unanimously by Planning and Zoning Commission. And I'd recommend approval with the conditions outlined in the staff report. And I don't think Brent has anything on this one. Not on this one. Uh, I, I did send out an email to, to all of you as a follow up uh, <coughs> with a couple of questions that came out. And everything yeah I think it did unless somebody brought up multiple questions or questions to you so I think it was just a matter Nothing of there. the drawings and the, the plats and trying to figure out because we thought there was two accesses yep. and now we yep. have that yeah it was hard to see it other was. questions okay Bill do we have that graphic that shows the connectivity and continuity of the two access points yes sir I could I could bring that up for you just one yeah. second here so this is the original plat um, you'll see there's your public uh, right away access. Got a little bit of glare here, guys. And then here's your private access. That's the original plat, uh, 2017 timeframe. Just doing the Greg thing. This is the original concept plan that was uh, provided at the rezoning. Again, this is not a legal document, it was just the concept plan of the rezoning. The site is overall similar in this use. All currently constructed? It's not all currently constructed. There are and lots there is, remaining. There, there is not two access points at this point in time. Uh, I drove them today. There are. You can drive from. You can drive from. This location. Let me get. Let me give you a better picture. You can currently drive here. Up and through. And you can also come in, here. Through parking lots, but I don't think that was the original intent. That was the original design. So if, if, if that wasn't intended, that's how- I, I have some history on this. That was not the original design to come through somebody's parking lot. It was supposed to be- Yeah, I think if you go back here. So this was still through, this private drive was still through that parking lot. Yeah, but you didn't have to wind through the senior housing to get there. Yeah, fair enough. I, I mean, in, in general, it's the same design. This is a, uh, a little more circuitous now, but that was, again, passed through I'm gonna probably agree to 2019. I'm going to that it's the same design, but thank you for your answer. Other questions? All right. This is on consent E. I'd like to entertain a motion that it remain the same for tomorrow night unless somebody would like to move it off of consent to items to appear. So moved. Moved to stay on consent. Do we have a second? Is that uh, Scott Webster? Thank you, sir. All those in favor of uh, taking it up as consent E tomorrow evening, signified by aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, we'll take it up as consent E. Uh, are there any other remaining consent agenda items that any particular council person would like to discuss or ask questions on at this time? You have items A through P as in Paul. Yes. Scott Webster. Oh, it takes me a little while to get my screen back here. <laughs> uh, mine's on 
Item G, the downtown facade and interior grant program. I'm just trying to get my memory refreshed here. I thought we used money that we had for our facade program because it wasn't getting used to help fund the downtown organization. Now we're funding the downtown organization and have a facade program back that it now looks like we're if I'm unless I'm wrong, that we're just giving to the downtown organization and letting them decide where it goes. So it sounds to me like we use the same bucket of money twice. But maybe I'm wrong. I don't understand. You want to handle it, Jeff? We funded it. Jump in. That, I believe. Yeah. So the downtown facade program monies, <clears throat> there was a bucket of fifty thousand dollars prior to COVID. When COVID hit, we paused that facade program just to see where our budget shook out. We additionally had a $30,000 professional services line item that was part of the economic development budget. And that's what was used to fund our contribution to the downtown Bettendorf organization. So what we have been asked to do here back in May, May 8th, I believe it was, Ryan Jancy presented to you the request to split a $50,000 line item for a facade program to be resurrected. They'd provide 25 and we would provide 25. That money was separate from our annual commitment to the downtown Bettendorf organization to fund their operational initiatives, if you will. So this is $25,000 request, which is part of a 50-50 program and total $50,000 to fund the facade program. There's a advisory group, which council member Sexer myself and Mark Hunt sit on in addition to downtown business owners that reviews facade applications, which we endorse the DBO being the head of that um, effort. Uh, it then takes administrative responsibility off of us as a staff and it provides them more flexibility than if the city was to continue to do it where we have additional regs that we have to impose in order to facilitate that program. So it's separate monies the $30,000 is a line item that we have in our operation. The $25,000 was from the downtown fund, which was the budgeted amount, excuse me, that was part of the budgeted amount of the $50,000 that we had in our budget as well. So both are budgeted and funded line items that we have. And the facade <clears throat> program, if you may recall, back when Council Member Lamar was still with us, that program was at about 100, I think it was $150,000, which dropped over the course of time simply based on the number of proposals that we received every year. How much do we fund the DBO? I'm sorry? How much do we fund them each year the outside DBO, of this? We provide $30,000 as our annual contribution. And then the request here was for $25,000 to support the facade program. So we're at 30 in the aisles at 120? No, we seeded for the first five years, the 125,000, Jeff. And that's in partnership with the aisle. Correct. For the for the initial seed money to get the thing going. Yep. And our thought was if after five years we'd evaluate whether or not either one of us would remain in, theoretically our hope was that we would back out and the yep. funds would be sufficient from the SMID to handle that. And then, as Jeff described, there were two other buckets. So there's really three buckets. Um, the 125 that we came in with for the seed money the 30 and then this 25 and and I could have swore and I'll, I'll go back and look but I could have swore that we put in 125 because we did have 150 in the facade program where we said we're not really going to do that so we're going to fund it now it looks like we're going back to the well again saying well we're going to go ahead and slip this back in there I could be easily wrong I'll go back and look at it myself tomorrow but I'm pretty sure that we use facade money as the excuse to give the 125 but I could be wrong actually I think we used downtown fund money Right, and on facade money, there does remain a facade line item within the downtown fund, and that's where this twenty-five thousand would come from. Um, it's just a little bit different mechanism for getting the money put to work. Yeah. That's no problem. I could easily on this one. I'm not going to say I'm right, but I could have swore that was the talk. <laughs> I got a golf ball that says you're right occasionally, but <laughs> I think I lost it. <laughs> it went to the right. I think it went. <laughs> It, it helps when you tee off and hit it the wrong direction, Decker. Thank you. That's an easier way to lose. <laughs> Any other? Yes, we'll devote to Greg and then to Bill. 
upon reviewing the uh, the items, I was surprised uh, under the fire captain on uh, H that they're part of the union. Their management, are they not? Under Iowa law, captain can be in the union and has been for probably 25 years. Oh. <laughs> That's why we have an assistant chief who's well, not we union. Had, we have two, the lieutenants in the police department are union, not Correct. Not union. They're, correct. The they're, equivalent they're, is a fire cap. Yeah. Well, it, it's just the way that okay. under I the just, law. I just the was surprised was, yeah. that they're not management. Correct. Okay. Thank you. Bill. If I can expound on Jeff, is the committee, the downtown committee, and you and Mark, do you guys have any minimum criteria for that facade money? I know that we have doled out money yeah. for things that in the past that probably didn't really enhance the downtown that much. Uh, how, how is that going to be looked at? That's a very apropos question, Council Member Connors. Um, we reviewed three, I believe it was three or four applications that Ryan Jancy brought forth. The program criteria were rewritten and the DBO board, the facade committee, which is made up of us, we reviewed those criteria. We thought they were very good. Um, we have found through the applications that some of the criteria need to be a little bit more um, firmly defined. And thanks to folks like Don Keller and Simon Bowie for being on this committee as well. Um, as property owners in the district, they felt that the language was good, however, not as strong as it should be. So we are gonna actually go back and review that. Ryan, I think set up a meeting for like October 2nd to firm up the criteria even a little bit stronger. And this kind of goes to the point I made about um, having some jurisdiction with the DBO. Those property owners are holding, holding themselves and the other property owners to a little bit higher standard than I think we would have, Council Member Connors. Um, and they have actually called themselves on the carpet already to say, we need to firm this up a little bit. So we're gonna rewrite what was rewritten and clean that up even more. Very good, yeah. thank you. And, yeah. and, they, and they have a limit. I think, what is it, the $15,000 limit uh, to, each, to each applicant? Correct. Jack? Your Honor, um, as you know, both Jerry and I sit on the board. I was not on the committee. <laughs> Uh, when the matter came to the board for vote, there was a pretty spirited discussion about the very issue that Jeff just talked about. Several board members had difficulty with some of the component parts of the program. However, because the committee had done its due diligence on the applications and had worked hard with the property owners, uh, it was agreed by the board that we would pass this initial round uh, under the criteria that had been developed to that point, but we charged the committee with going back and rewriting uh, to make it even more stringent. And to Jeff's point, the board, which is primarily the downtown owners, felt that some of these items were really more maintenance items and should not have been funded to the tune they were. But we felt in fair, fairness to the applicants that they went with the criteria that we put out there. So uh, the board recommended approval and it was approved by that vote last week and the committee's charged with now rewriting the criteria. So um, I, I agree with Jeff. I think the board is uh, even harder on the applicants than maybe we would have been um, and they're taking it to a stricter level. So it's, and, and to be honest with you, we didn't have to do much work with this. So it was good that way, even though Mark and Jeff are on that committee. And, no. and in fairness to the program, uh, I agree that some of the work is maintenance and repair, what I would consider routine maintenance and repair. But at the same time, when we administered our own facade program with our money, we also funded maintenance and repair, you know? Like I remember down at, uh, was it TMI? We funded their parking lot resurfacing. You know, that sounds like maintenance and repair to me. One example, Council Member Connors, that I'll state with you is the question in the application about um, types of building improvements. And 
itemized out were things like HVAC, air conditioning, plumbing, et cetera, et cetera. And Simon Bowie made the very good point of saying, if someone is adding air conditioning to their property, that's an improvement that's gonna increase the taxable valuation of the property. If someone's air conditioner is there and it goes out and we're simply helping them replace an air conditioner that they have, that doesn't improve the quality or the taxable valuation of that property. So if it's an additional amenity that you're adding to make the property value go up, we need to elaborate on that versus just simply helping people with maintenance and repair. Which is a true like intent. Some savvy uh, <coughs> committee members there. Thank you. Sure. Any other thoughts or questions on anything on consent before we approve its consideration for tomorrow night? Seeing none, I'd like to uh, entertain a motion to approve our consent agenda. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Unanimously, we'll take up our consent agenda items tomorrow night. We'll move to our presentations. Thank you, Brent. Thank you, Mark. Appreciate it. We are looking for an update on our strategic planning goals and objectives for fiscal year 2020 through 2021. And Decker, why don't you organize our discussion here? Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. Um, and for the council members, if you switch your screen back to your agenda and you, I think you go to the PDF up in the upper left-hand corner, correct, Michelle? Uh, it's just right next. It says strategic plan. Strategic goal. plan up on the left. Touch yep. the tab. If you hit that tab, you can see it online. We've got in front of you. A whole bunch of pieces of paper right here. A whole bunch. You can also follow in the paper in front of you. Want to make notes? Um, it's a, so we've got it broken into a couple different ways for you. First off, we gave you, if you look, at, you got your strategic plan in the color document sitting in front of you. And then uh, also is, if you look here, you see that I, we did the top 10 policy agenda items and they're a little bit of red and pink. And then the policy agenda. We don't have that one. Yes, you do. No, I think. We don't. We do have. Ah, all right. These two. All right. We don't have the red and pink. All right. Well, then I'll just work my way through that. How's that? Because <laughs> I have it. Yeah, you I know, know in the you're future as we get these, if we get these beforehand, we may not have to, you don't have to read them to us. Well, we, weekend, didn't, but we, we, we didn't quite get them through the weekend, Your we Honor. Understand. So We understand. So the, the top 10 on your policy agenda in the, uh, the red and yellow and green and blue, uh, I'm just going to go on and call on folks to make the report. Um, the document that you have that has all the tabs on it is what you have in front of you on your screen and it's by the department that was assigned to the item. And that they put them in, in their order as their assignments were there. So let's start with the policy agenda, the community center disposition and redevelopment. Jeff, do you wanna take that report? Yes, thank you, Decker. So we uh, created the RFP document that we vetted through all of you and um, we have issued that to the public. We are accepting responses to that RFP uh, through October 22nd. The uh, bids will be open at 10 a.m., at which time we'll present them to you for your consideration as well. Um, again, I, I would say that this is somewhat of a subjective approval process. Um, we, we have been asked if we're gonna have a scoring rubric or something along those lines by a couple of developers, and we felt it more important to have ability to um, choose what we believe to be the highest and best use. So um, October 22nd is the deadline to respond to those RFPs. I have heard from a couple of developers that they just don't have the time in their stable right now to, a, to, to go after this. So they're gonna pull out and not respond to the RFP. I've heard from others and actually taken three developers through the building since the RFP was issued uh, to review it, to see if it's salvageable or if they wanna start from scratch. So as I had mentioned in my presentation, Previously, I think we're going to get four to six potential responses, everything from repurposing the building and trying to use it to a complete redo. It could be anywhere in between. So October 22nd, we hope to see those responses, and I'll provide them to you at that time. Perfect. The Riverfront Development west of I-74. Jeff, you want to take that one as well? So the plan for riverfront development uh, west of the bridge, it's a complex issue because it, it's going to require uh, a lot of parcel assemblage. And as we've seen with parcel assemblages in downtown, they tend to take a little time. Um, 
but there has been some movement afoot. <clears throat> it is developer driven, if you will, and we are relying on the developer to provide us with a plan for the corridor and what he, his team can see as a development opportunity. We, we expect to see a draft plan by early 2022. We've worked with a couple of the anchor business owners in that Westbridge district on per, uh, possible property acquisitions or redevelopment plans. The conversations are going pretty well. Um, there's a couple property owners that are considering just continuing to operate as is, but we do think there's some um, ability here to navigate either with those property owners or in and around those property owners for redevelopment. The area in question we're really looking at is going to also be contingent upon what happens with civil after they vacate our premises um, at the old line pile. They're using that for staging with the bridge right now. If civ civil happens to get future work on the demolition of the green bridge, this could take this project out a little bit further. Um, or it could be where civil vacates the property, grades the site as they're contractually obligated to do so, and we can look at redevelopment. But yeah, the property in question we're talking about right now is that area there specifically north of Leech Park and then up through the Village Inn and that corridor there. So we hope by the spring of 22, we're going to have a plan to look at and start to put some process in place to hopefully help that developer execute their plan. Thank you, sir. Uh, the pool splash pad report and direction. Um, Kim, I'll start with the pool and then you can take the splash pad okay. part of it if that's okay. So um, we are looking at all of our options on the pool. We still think that a referendum in March um, is doable. Um, as you know, the Park Foundation, uh, when we last met, uh, agreed to hire a consultant uh, to assist with a referendum. That person is still uh, in play, um, and the park still has, Park Foundation still has the money for that program. Um, we are um, working on that location uh, as well as an alternate location uh, to discuss with you, and we will reactivate the committee when we're uh, ready for that discussion. And then Kim can talk about some direction that we've been kind of looking at for the splash pads uh, and with the advisory board that's just been established. So, yes, thank you. So, um we have surveyed all of the parks um, and looked at parking, access to water, um, access accessibility for people to go, and really trying to keep it a sort of a neighborhood attraction rather than a Quad City area-wide attraction. So seemingly the top parks that would have these accommodations would be Hoover Park. Um, they do need water service, but there's a lot of space there and parking, um, and there's lots of space to add additional parking as well. Meyer Park um, needs a bit of construction, but sort of um, proximity wise to where our current splash pad is, um, seemingly that neighborhood would be a good option as well. Um, another option would be Kiwanis Park. Um, and then after that would be Ed Sheck Park, which has lots of parking. It's a small park, but there's, there's ample parking there. So we'll continue to um, assess the needs for uh, splash pads at those locations moving forward. Okay. Uh, police services, uh, patrol staffing, uh, fourth police beat. I think we handled this with uh, mostly staffing. And Keith, you just want to give an update on where we're at with the staffing that we did in the budget and where we stand today with those guys. Thanks, Dicker. Uh, City Council, Mayor. So if you remember, uh, you approved three additional hiring of officers as of July of this year. And uh, with, so we are on that path working uh, diligently with HR. Uh, there, there's challenges here just because of the times we're living in, but we, uh, we are working, we've got just one graduated from the academy, we've got two that are currently in the academy, and we have one set to go to the January academy, and as of today, we just opened up our uh, hiring uh, application process again today uh, with the goal of getting a, a new list done so that we are ready for the May academy of next year. Um, so we are, just due to some unforeseen circumstances of, of unexpected people leaving, uh, it's uh, 
we're kind of just trying to maintain where we're at, but we just it just we just have to keep plugging along and just keeping this uh, application and hiring process going here strong for the next uh, year, so we can get back up to where we want to be for authorized strength. We've exhausted the current list. Uh, pretty much, yes. Yeah. So I've given conditional offers on all of those uh, that are out there currently. Yep. So the three that we authorized in the budget technically were hired, but we've had some retirements or disabilities, so we're still short people. But so to Keith's point, we're now reestablishing a new list to hire, uh, to replace those folks, and to be ready if the council uh, in our budget discussions in uh, goal setting and in uh, January uh, place additional officers in the budget, we'll have a new list to be able to handle any hiring that would occur there. Greg. What's our actual authorized strength now? Is it 48? 48. And we currently technically have 48 on the payroll, <laughs> but we have 42, what I would consider actively capable on shift working uh, right now. And that includes the people we've, that includes two that are in the academy, obviously, and it includes the one that's back from the academy uh, going through field training, but I'm not counting them because until they're on their own, uh, I'm not gonna count them, but sure. we, but we, uh, so we're at, I would say we have 45 people that are on their way to becoming, you know, uh, full-time officers, and we've got three that are, I would say, inactive right now. Scott? Thank you. Um, the county board did something on this a couple of years ago, and I wonder if, it, if we would need it or it would be worthwhile. They actually authorized the sheriff to be too above for those transfers in and outs. Does our chief have that authority to hire before when he knows somebody's leaving in order to get them through academy? We, they did that on purpose so that they could transition people in and out. Go ahead. If it, so if I can, yeah, I would say that I we have constant, I've been in constant communication with Kathleen with HR and Decker. So when those uh, opportunities present themselves, then I have approached them. And I think that, uh, I think we have done that in the past, and I think moving forward to be strategic and all this, I'll probably ask again, just like kind of an overlap, yeah. you know, of an overlap there, so we aren't down be, down as long. So I think that's at least a, a a possibility that I I will continue if I see that opportunity. I'll continue to uh, have conversations with HR and Decker, and if we can do that, I, I would I would feel comfortable at least presenting it to council. Yeah, if you just, I thought it was a great idea when they did it because you know Greg is. Um, taught me a ton about that more than I want to know about a police department, but how you kind of have those overlaps. And I don't realize they did it, and I realized we got people coming in and out. And it, I didn't know if you could administratively do it or if you needed us to do it. We, so we, we did it administratively, where in particular we had an officer that um, had uh, was doing uh, permanent uh, guard duty, if you will, or uh, military duty, uh, and uh, we replaced him full time uh, while he was still here, knowing that he likely is not coming back to us. So we authorized administratively for that position to be filled, and so we're doing that as we see these situations occur. As you know, we have a couple of disabilities pending, and we that's why we went ahead with these three uh, and authorized the the list to be the new list to be established to try to keep ahead of it uh, if we can. So we're, from a from a HR perspective, we're trying to stay at the pace the chief wants to be at. Um, and if we can get in front of it, we're, we're trying to get in front of it. And there's a little cash flow sometimes with that because there are people still on the payroll till we get their status resolved. Yeah, that's I think that's the do part of you. You can actually be approved for a few officers more, but it's only for interim. Right. Bill. So. Uh, Kathleen and Keith, are you getting robust interest in your job search? Well, so we've worked together. So being that we just opened up the application process again today for through, I believe, the, the beginning of uh, November, 
Uh, we are we are looking at we are looking at various ways we can get the word out there for for recruiting. But understand, these are still challenging times, uh, both locally and nationally, as far as recruiting. Uh, the numbers the numbers are way down for people that are interested in this profession, and uh, you know, and I don't want to lower our standards. And we have, I, I am. I feel comfortable that we will we will be able to get good qualified candidates in the future, but I just don't think we're going to get the numbers like we used to. But if if I'd like to I'd like to get a, a bigger list than we had the last time. But uh, we're going to I know working with HR, we're going to do everything we can to try and do that to get the word out na we, nationally and locally. Are we competitive at pay grade? Yeah. Oh God, yeah. Yeah, we're we're about even right now. I, I, right now, there was a time in the Quad Cities we're all about it's uh, we're all about equal now for for pay right now in the Quad Cities. So it's I mean, <laughs> it's not just about pay. You know, it's the quality of life and 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 job and and the culture here. So I mean, there's there's other things other than than pay that draw people here to to the Benton Police Department. Mm -hmm. Kathleen. I would uh, completely agree with that, but it's you know it's not just in the police department area. It's pretty much across the board in terms of applicants at this time. Um, we're reviewing obviously not only the recruitment but also the processes that we have. Uh, like Keith had stated, you know we have certain specific criteria that we want to maintain because then we end up getting the ca the uh, that level of employee to work with us. So um, we're hopeful that this time, as long as we have it in, that we'll be able to get additional bodies as we than we have in the past. Thank you. And just to show the sign of the times, yesterday I stopped at Arby's and just as I was getting my my drink, the lady said, we're hiring people at 1250 an hour if you're interested. <laughs> and uh, I said, well, I, I'm, I think I'm uh, I'm really properly placed currently. But if, <laughs> if my employers don't believe that, um, I may be back. Uh, gonna... <laughs> so and she said, we're, we're paying 1250 an hour. And if you know somebody, um, We'd, we'd love to have you contact them. So I think we all know of the turmoil that's out in the marketplace right now. I'm impressed so, you sat through a drive through <laughs> I was picking something and, up for someone else. Oh. And 1250 <laughs> is more than Decker made as an officer starting out and me. It was less than that per hour when yeah, we started. that's correct. So maybe somebody saw that I was finally worth my weight in gold here. <laughs> Anything else on that one? Uh, City Enterprise uh, Operations Oversight Committee. Jason, do you want to talk about this one? Uh, yeah, again, uh, apropos, <clears throat> later this week, uh, we'll introduce a draft policy to council um, that kind of addresses this action as well as uh, another one on the list, the subsidy policy. So uh, what I've tried to do in the policy is, is address both of those action items. The policy outlines the creation and expectations of an oversight committee, uh, and then also provides a framework for analyzing the performance of those tax-supported enterprise funds and how we might uh, prioritize subsidy dollars towards those that are most successful. So we'll be talking about that with you guys uh, later this week, and I'm excited to hear your feedback so we can get that into place. I'll move on if you're okay, Your Honor. Um, yes, please. Cybersecurity policy and response. So I'll let Kathleen talk about that as so, much as she can talk about it. <laughs> Without going into grave detail, um, I have been working in conjunction with Jason's department as well as IT. Um, we continue to work with ICAP and Arthur J. Gallagher in terms of what type of cybersecurity programs are out there, how we can be better within our systems. Um, and uh, we've also looked at our inventories and our processes and continue to do so. That being said, we've uh, Jason has contracted with Barry Dunn, and honestly, we've had a tremendous amount of input and uh, conversation uh, with Barry Dunn and other departments so that we can devise, um, we identified 25 key areas so that we can continue <coughs> to uh, strengthen our system accordingly. Um, I, we are also looking at insurance, but obviously with cybersecurity being such a very large area right now, not many people are really writing cybersecurity policies or additional policies. We do have insurance with ICAP. We're just taking a look to possibly enhance that. Um, without going into any more, I didn't know if Jason wanted to add anything from that. Uh, no, we've done a couple of 
just kind of uh, housekeeping uh, practice improvements uh, internally here, and I'm, I'm sure we'll be sharing some of those with you. I think you guys have been the victims of some of those uh, new practices. Um, I just sent an email to Decker today about needing something that I don't need. What was it? <laughs> I don't know. You needed my immediate help with something. And yes. yes. I get, get those too. a lot. Yeah. You get it too? I get, I get it too. Oh, I'm glad I didn't just we send it to We get those Decker. a lot. The irony, the irony of that was I had gotten about a, an email from him about 20 seconds before that on something else. And then I got this email that he needed help right away. So I wrote back <laughs> to him on the first email, man, you're a busy guy. <laughs> <laughs> The problem is, when he really does need help, none of us are going to be there. Nobody's going to be there. I'm sorry, but it, it's a struggle. It's real. That's, it is. So I think between the combination of um, the information we've gotten from ICAP um, and the consultant that uh, I, the finance and IT hired to analyze all the enterprise solutions, we're going to have some pretty robust mm -hmm. um uh, strategic planning on this uh, coming into the budget, uh, I'm certain you're going to see some increase in dollars yes. um, for our IT operations and and new software, um, mm -hmm. as well as cybersecurity issues that will come with that. So That's correct. Um, that will take some of the budget, but um, I think we'll be ready by budget time. Yep. Um, and we may, we may even by the time you go into goal setting, it we might have a draft report. Yeah, we should be able to have some pretty good discussions by goal setting. Yep. Excellent. Yes, Jason. Scott. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. Do you have um, the cybersecurity? I don't know if it it falls under process improvement. It's not really a cyber attack, but where the vendors are asking to switch bank accounts. I mean, a lot of neighboring communities have been publicized for that lately. I assume that's just an easy. You know, yeah. double authentication or something that you can go through. It's something we've been talking a lot about with with staff uh, lately, as as you've mentioned the the news articles uh, in the news lately. Um, yeah, we definitely have practices in place to verify those types of changes. The other thing I would mention is in both of those cases, as as far as I know, those were EFT payments. Uh, we do very little of that type of payment, so we wouldn't be sending money from our bank account to someone else's bank account directly. Um, it's uh, it's convenient, and it's certainly a way that vendors like to get paid, but this kind of goes to show, you know, a good old-fashioned check <laughs> still works pretty good, too. But taking that even further with direct deposit with our employees, the whole change my, my payroll from this account to this account, mm -hmm. Um, we've gotten to the point where we don't accept those anymore on email whatsoever. They have to fill out a piece of paper. So I think the the staff across the board, I mean, not just in finance, but everywhere, it's 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 always questioned if it's on an email. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. In, in fact, uh, how we I think we got started there was Kathleen got an email from me saying, <laughs> change my bank account. And she walked down and she goes, <laughs> Put a oh, form in there. okay, uh, here's the form. And I go, what, what are you talking about? Yep. It looks and she said, you just sent me an email asking me to change your bank account. I said, I didn't send you. <laughs> so we went, we're stopping that practice. That's right. Mm -hmm. well, the, the attempts are, are getting uh, more and more sophisticated all the time, but I think we're on top of it. Thank you. Anything else? Okay. Definitely. Annexation action plan. I think uh, Chris covered a lot of this with you already. Yep. Um, so probably doesn't need a major report, but Chris, do you want to handle that? Sure. Thank you, Decker. Um, so this item really, you know, two major points to this. One, the, the MOU or really the, the boundary. Um, we've had a lot of discussion with our neighboring jurisdictions and with the, uh, um, on that point, um, there are a number of ways to deal with the, the line issue, some of which um, we'll need to talk potentially about the comprehensive plan and, and how that's addressed in there. Um, on the voluntary actions, we have had Discussions um, with landowners. We are, we have a voluntary application um, on our website. We've talked with the city development board to be fully prepared, and we are going to have additional discussions on this topic later this week with you. So uh, we can um, go into that in a little bit more detail. But I think we're making good progress. Thank you. All right. Next item. Subdivision ordinance, um, most of this is covered. I'm going to let Brian and Mark handle this. I think Brian will handle most of it, yeah. and then Mark can uh, tap on top. Thank you. If you recall, uh, on September 7th, we approved the, we had the third and final reading of uh, amending our subdivision ordinance where we actually 
increased the sidewalk width from four feet to si uh, five feet. Um, we actually increased the right-of-way width from 52 to 53, and then we added the sump pump collection system with a uh, companion resolution that was with that for a 50-50 cost share for um, uh, with the developers over a five-year period. And for our part in community development, it matches well with our current upgrade to our zoning ordinance. So those two will uh, be in tandem with each other, if you will. And then also, we, as we've seen things, we've been sending them to Brian that we've come across just during planning review on subdivision ordinance uh, improvements that he may want to consider. So we've sent a couple, three things to him probably in the past month, I would say. Greg has a question. Go ahead, Greg. If if the sidewalk is a an infill and it's four feet, four, we don't make it do five, right? That is correct. This is only in uh, new subdivisions. Okay, thank you. I, I thought that was right, but yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron. You bet. Uh, citywide um, information technology master plan. We covered this a little bit, but I think Jason can give you a little better um, update. Yeah, as you'll recall, we hired Barry Dunn in the spring to conduct a citywide technology needs assessment. And this goes, uh, it covers cybersecurity, but goes deeper um, citywide. Uh, we put together a project management team that has representation from every department and have convened several times over the summer and facilitated uh, fact finding um, and prioritization exercises for Barry Dunn to then kind of work into the plan. Last week, we actually got together uh, for three hours on Thursday morning and prioritized about 25 projects that have been identified through this process. Um, and those will now be um, put into a five-year strategic IT plan. Uh, the next step is between us and Barry Dunn to put some resources to the plan, be it cost, labor, um, those types of things, and and then have for you come, uh, hopefully, budget time, a... a uh, a five-year outlook of, of what we could get done uh, and the cost for those types of items. So really excited to get that finished and start working that plan. And, and just so we kind of understand, our finance platform on our AS400 is 31 years old. Mm -hmm. uh, very functional, but uh, 31 years old, and, and we're all comfortable with it, but we could use... Um, we could use moving up. I can tell you that that came out as the top priority of the 25. There's some work to do before we get there, uh, but that, that's number one. Okay. Our next item. Uh, the city subsidy policy, we talked a little bit about that. Maybe you want to articulate them a little more? Um, like I said, I kind of hope to, to Couple that with the oversight committee of those uh, tax subsidized enterprise operations. I think that was the intent of, of both of those actions and I'll be presenting that policy to you later this week. The code enforcement nuisance abatement enhancements. I can tell you that um, you, you've seen some regular reports from Mark on the training that his team has gone through, the work they've gone through, and I couldn't be more pleased other than the court actions uh, that have been delayed. Uh, but uh, Mark should probably get the gold star tonight because last week, not only did uh, he take the complaint from the neighbor, he took his lawnmower up there and cut the grass uh, himself because we, I think we had either terminated the contract, we, we, did suspend we suspended our, our, our uh, mowing crew uh, for some billing issues. Uh, so Mark became the mowing crew that night uh, and cut the grass next to Tommy Mason's house at 3103 Maple Crest and, and then sent us pictures. I'm certain that he was actually not cutting the grass, but he took the pictures of him looking like he was cutting the grass. I thought there was something in the background, but anyways. Certainly starting evening at Arby's here coming up too, so. <laughs> Mark, do you want to take this? This has been a great, a great enhancement, in my opinion. Thank you, thank you, Decker, for saying those those kind words. Really, my update is is more of a punch list of, of things we have ongoing and upcoming. I would point your attention to uh, if you have the same list I have: four, five, six, seven, and eight. Those are just trials we have scheduled, or um, um, pre-trial conferences we have scheduled. So it's really all in the courts right now, and the courts have been really slow. 
We've had great support from Chris Curran and um, the Assistant Attorney Rex Ridenauer in getting these things processed. It's just now so many of the bigger cases that you're familiar with without uh, you know, naming addresses are really just at that court level and getting getting them through district court and getting it uh, adjudicated to, to do a demo if, that, if that's required is where we're at with those key properties. Um, and so uh, I think we're, we're on the right track. We are being uh, very attentive to our, our long-term properties and really trying to stay consistently visiting those properties, communicating with the owners what our expectations are. Um, in some cases, we've, we've seen some good results. We'll move on. Uh, the downtown lower speed limits. Um, Brian, do you want to handle that? Yes, or sir. Thank you. Um, at the request of the city, we met with the Iowa Department of Transportation and conducted a speed study along State Street and Grant Street uh, between 6th and uh, 26th. Uh, the posted speed limit varies throughout this corridor uh, between 30 miles an hour and 35 miles an hour. Uh, we worked with the police department. Laser counts were um, taken at various locations along this corridor, as well as working with the DOT, who actually took uh, counts as well on uh, seven different days between March and August of 2020. Uh, the results of the study indicated that the 85th percentile, which is used um, in terms of determining speed limit uh, uh, justification changes, uh, it's a standard that's used, um, uh, determined that the speed limit um, was actually um, recommended that we actually raise the speed limit through this corridor to 35. Uh, the DOT is not going to require us as a municipality to raise those rates or, or raise those limits, but to keep them, the, keep them the same if we so choose. So they did not recommend us to lower those speed limits. Uh, we just recently met with um, the Healthy Homes um, and Downtown uh, Audit, and the suggestion was made uh, during a, a walkthrough uh, to consider potentially shrinking uh, the street, because if you recall uh, to the east of 26th, uh, there is two lanes of highway going in each direction. And in, in sections of the one ways there, there actually is uh, three lanes uh, in each direction. And um, in order, to, uh, during this walk or this audit, we uh, determined that the sidewalks were uh, really tight up against the curb and didn't really create that walkable uh, community that we were looking for. So. Uh, we will be visiting with the DOT to potentially look at uh, uh, shrinking the width of that to two lanes in each direction, which will actually widen that through that corridor and actually um, increase more of a walkable, livable community uh, through this uh, area between uh, State and Grant and 6th and 26th. Nice. Questions? Seeing none, let's go to the All next right. item. If that looks like that might be it, though, right? So the high, we'll just go to the high priorities, Your Honor, and then we'll, okay. we can, everybody else can do their own reading on their own. So the rental um, registration and inspection program, Mark, you want to talk about the work that you guys have done there as well? Yes, uh, thank you, Decker. We have um, we fully embraced that within our department. We have both code enforcement officers, uh, myself on occasion, and one of the city planners on occasion covering those inspections. We're over 200 inspections. Um, we started uh, less than a year ago. 200 units inspected, probably 240, if I'm not mistaken. Um, for the most part, the, prob the problem properties have been the ones we focused on, so the ones we're getting complaints on either from residents, or sometimes from landlords, or sometimes from neighbors. We tried to give the, the squeaky wheel the grease and get those caught up. Newer units that are just coming on and being licensed, we're having our city planner uh, hit those. They tend, the new units tend to be um, obviously in good condition. New to the license, not, ne not necessarily new, newly built units, but they tend to be in good condition just coming into the rental market. Um, we probably need to look at what we're using for our rental tracking software. While Llama is great for permits and building an inspection, um, it's a little clunky to say the least when it comes to tracking rental inspections. So we might, uh, as this technology process goes forward, we might look at either a different option or enhancing LLAMA or uh, a, a third option, perhaps. Do you want to handle, um, at the same time, the uh, Section 8 housing? Yep, sec well, the Section 8 ordinance, the same thing. It's all together. 
Yeah, so, yeah, and, and what we've done there is, is really tried to build our relationships with East Niagara Regional Housing Authority. Both Deck and I are on that board. Um, in fact, I missed uh, an important meeting the other night so I could attend their board meeting. They've been receptive to our concerns and I think they're looking to be more helpful. Um, Section 8 inspections are done separately. They're not done by the city. That's a different inspection. Now, that unit will be inspected by us under our rental ordinance, and if we do see issues, we do let our partners at Eastern Iowa Regional Housing Authority know, and they've been responsive. Promotion. All right, uh, Jeff, the Bettendorf promotion, and why don't you handle proactive city communications at the same time? Sure, thank you, Decker. Uh, I would suggest a lot of work has been done in this arena over the past year. And I'll kind of talk uh, about a couple of those items and kind of to piggyback off of what Mark just said about the Section 8 housing. Uh, there was a newspaper story written over the weekend that was published. And um, I think one of the important things that we're looking at doing with our proactive communications planning and strategy is uh, implementing controls and being able to control the messaging we want pushed out. And while the story had a lot of content in it, I don't think it was a clear picture. And if we have the ability to control our messaging, it seems to do a, a lot more positive than um, negative. So just want to throw that in. I'll talk a little bit about what we're doing here. So the city's website will be a catalytic new tool uh, driving public engagement. It's going to be that hub for information dissemination. All of our staff across the city have been working on content and migration of our old site information to the new site. Um, it's gonna rely heavily on staff participation moving forward. And again, altruistically, this is gonna be one of the very few sources where we have the ability to control the messaging and the narrative, which is gonna be crucial to getting information to the public real time and also real factual. So we're very excited about that. And we expect the new website to go live in late October, early November at the latest. Um, it's a very labor intensive task. And as many of the department heads sitting up here will attest, we've had a number of meetings to make sure that this goes uh, in the direction we wish to have it go. So the website is progressing very, very nicely. We're at the point now where, where we are migrating information over and we're very excited about the product that we'll deliver to you. Um, a couple of the other um, <coughs> proactive communication items that we're doing. Um, Staff has worked with Tag Communication on developing uh, and producing two new, what we're calling hype videos for Bettendorf, H-Y-P-E, hype. And we're gonna launch the first one in tandem with the new website whenever it comes on board. Uh, we think it's gonna really shed a positive light on the city of Bettendorf and we're excited about it. That second video will be more um, geared towards winter amenities and winter services that we offer and that one will launch uh, later in the winter months after we see snow. I'm sorry to say that, Brian, um, but we'll do that in tandem with snow falling. Uh, social media is obviously a powerful and cost-effective tool that we've tried to capitalize on as much as we can. We're using our outlets to promote Bettendorf to potential new residents, young professionals, young people who are originally from Bettendorf in an attempt to try to attract them back. And I guess just some numbers I'd like to share with you really quick. Our Facebook presence and our followers increased by 15.3% since September of 2020. Um, and we're averaging 598 new followers a year since the inception of Facebook for the city. Our Twitter presence was up 2.5% this past year. We're averaging 372 followers a year since the inception of our Twitter page. Our YouTube presence grew 70% this past year. Uh, YouTube is telling us that we have over 24,000 views, and I can tell you over half of those occurred this past year. So I think that speaks volumes to the amount of social media that we're pushing out there, but it also shows how people are getting their information differently today than in years past. 12,000 views on, on YouTube for a municipality is a very strong number. A lot of those um, watching the mayor's message on Friday. <laughs> yes. A lot of those are coming in through Facebook and then going to the YouTube to watch. That's what I thought. You're trying to make me feel better over here. I keep writing him notes about stuff I want more information on. Now he's like, oh, yeah. Give him a little pat on the head. I can't wait. Uh, to, I, see, I, can't, I, see where this is I can't going, wait till 11 o'clock on Friday morning. 
<laughs> Did you just get ready for a whole hour reviewing the last one so that when the new one drops at noon, you're already brought exactly. up to speed? Exactly. I okay. know where I'm at. Well, thank you, Denise, it's, it's, for making sure that our city administrator is uh, preparing himself for the mayor's message that drops every Friday at noon. So, shameless plug. Fame. Hall of Fame. <laughs> it, it's Hall interesting. Of fame. City administrator. Thank you very much. We, we oh, started... Yeah. We started sure. those videos, as you re re may recall, as a response to COVID and to give folks weekly updates on COVID and what's going on in our community. And they've evolved into what they are today. And this goes to the point, a lot of, I got to remember, I make sure I say this right. A lot of um, influencers, excuse me, social media influencers suggest that authentic content is what is really important to people today. And authentic content meaning the people that are serving you or the people that offer you product and goods and services are the people they want to see. And I think Denise can attest to this. When we show or talk about a police or firefighter and have them in the video, i.e. Matt Lawson a couple weeks back talking about his experience out east and down in the south, that authentic content really drives up social media presence, follows, likes, et cetera. If uh, one of our public works officials talks about the snowplow rodeo and how they're training for it, that's a credible source talking about authentic content that affects our constituents. Those things really move the needle. So, Your Honor, you've started something that's very, very well received, and uh, I think we're going to continue to try to um, elaborate on that in the future. You just lost the gold star, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> All total, over those three platforms, Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube, today we have over 12,000 followers. Uh, so the city of Bettendorf's social media presence is incredibly strong. One other area that we're getting a lot of inquiry about and we're not fully ready to dabble in this yet is live streams over YouTube. We currently have one live stream and it's of a um, sewer drain into Duck Creek behind um, the treehouse. Um, it was that, previously- That higher ratings than the mayor's message. So. <laughs> <laughs> we actually have a couple of folks that actually tune into this live stream all the time just because they're out of town and they like to see a little bit of Benton Tour. <laughs> Unfortunately, it's wow. a sewer drain into Duck Creek. Um, but there is a lot of question and inquiry about if we could do more live streaming of just the city and the different amenities we have going on. And we, we've, we've entertained those questions, but we have some reluctance. More to come on that. Um, and just all the credit to these uh, initiatives, the website development, the hype videos that we're constructing, the social media presence, I know as very little about this, and I, I don't want to discredit and discount what my staff knows here, but Lauren and Denise have learned a lot, and they've done a lot of work to try to make these things happen. So it does not happen in a vacuum, and it does not happen overnight. So I appreciate the work that they have done um, to try to build those platforms up. One final note, and Decker asked me to touch on this last week, an interesting proactive city communication item that we have available to us today is the bet, bettendorf.gov email extension. As you're all aware, our email extension today is our name at bettendorf.org. And uh, Chief Kimball brought it to our attention not some time back at the communications committee about what it means to have a .gov extension. So our IT staff went out and did some recon to make sure that there was not another bettendorf.gov anywhere and that we could actually apply to the feds to get this this handle if you will and we did we we procured this we now own bettendorf.gov and our public safety officials specifically are using it today so what it does is it provides you um, a lot of credibility as a public safety outlet um, org or com can be basically getting gotten by anyone Dot gov takes a lot more checks and balances to procure that and get it. And it does cite you then as a credible public safety source, which is very, very important in the line of work that they are in. So we're very excited to have it. Um, it it's a bit of a philosophical question now to what extent we take that to, because we all as city officials have access to a Bettendorf.gov extension if we wish to go down that path. I just don't have the knowledge or skill set right now to speak informed enough about whether or not we should do it. But all of our city elected officials, public officials, staff, we could just migrate to Bettendorf.gov if we wish. It's not a quick transition because we all have Bettendorf.org. But if we chose to do so, it is at our disposal if we'd like to do it. 
but we really do see the benefit of having it for our public safety officials. Um, it does not get blocked as easily by spam filters, but when you get something from a .gov, it goes through a lot more streamlined and efficiently, and you're more apt to get it as a recipient if it comes from someone in a .gov scenario. So there was a lot of benefit for public safety getting that access. We now have it, and we can go further with it as a city if we chose to do so. Is there any less spoofing with .govs? I mean, the random, hey, it looks like it came from the mayor, but it didn't really come from. I don't know the answer to that. Yeah, I mean, I can't answer that right now. Yeah, I think it's you just still have to be really diligent in looking at the actual email address, not the name attached to it. Yeah. Um, but obviously, the .gov uh, lends some credibility to an email, so uh, you can probably trust those a touch more. If you saw the one from the mayor today, that email was a goofy address. <laughs> um, so I think we're all getting better. I put it together. <laughs> <laughs> I transferred all my bank account money over to him. I, <laughs> I haven't seen that yet, so check that email address. <laughs> I, was, I, I see no reason. Why we continue to talk about it. Maybe we talk about it, tackle it yeah. in goal setting. But I see no reason, as we talked about originally when this came up, that everybody would migrate to it. You'd keep the .com, and that would still get to you, and you'd phase that out over time, and the .govs would be your new address. Right. We, uh, I, I thought it was a seamless transition where if you had your – B Gallagher at Bettendorf.org and someone sent it to .gov, you would just get it. It's not that simple. They are two separate and distinct things. So it would have to be a migration where we phase out .org and move to .gov, but we can certainly do it. I don't, I don't see any detriment to doing it. Um, we just have to figure out the process to get it done. Okay. Jeff, wasn't there some discussion during that call that, that, that you could put a forward on it? That yeah. it would I believe that there was, right? So Yeah, you can. If anyone wishes to send something to you, um, we could set it up with our IT staff to just have all emails forwarded to this new address and then kind of migrate it out over time. We certainly could do that. So it's, it would just essentially be bringing your regular recipients and your regular folks that you communicate with up to speed on your new handle, your new extension, if you will, and then, yeah, it'd migrate out over time. All right. I think, and I believe Scott County government has done that transition because they were .com and they're now transitioned to .gov. So Scott County government has done that. We'll be in touch with them about their transition. All right. Anything Thank else? I-80 water and sewer line extensions. Um, Brian, are you going to handle this? Yes, sir. I saw Brent sitting back there waiting to say something. <laughs> Every year we wait, the money goes, ahead. it gets anyway, more expensive. Um, we hired McClure Engineering uh, Company to do the entire network, um, to evaluate the entire city's network, to identify areas of I&I &I, um, and whatnot. As part of that study, they evaluated the hydraulic capacity of uh, potentially sewering uh, Middle Road and 80 um, uh, Road prior to the development of the TBK complex and the surrounding commercial properties. Uh, the main concern was that the city did not have, uh, from council that was brought up, the potential to serve uh, that area uh, north of 80. Uh, we do have an existing um, wet well or a pumping station at the northeast corner of 80 and Middle Road that exists now. Um, that could very easily be retrofitted for approximately $200,000 to sewer approximately uh, 400 to 450 acres immediately north of uh, Interstate 80 at this time. Can you also talk about the water line? The water line, uh, Iowa American Water um, uh, would then cover, uh, first of all, what they would do is, um, depending on what could potentially go up there, um, they would pay uh, for uh, the extension of an eight inch line. Uh, most likely we would need something larger in size to serve that area. Iowa American Water would then cover um, any additional costs up to the eight inch line for that growth, or we would cover anything over an eight inch line installation. Uh, the current rate for 2021 is $78 per foot, putting the estimated cost to run a uh, water line up there north between $200,000 to $250,000 um, to get water service up to north of Interstate 80 if we so chose. Brian, could I add a few things to yes, that? Sir. Um, 
IO American is looking at additional elevated storage north of 80. Uh, they have not started siting any locations, but they've told us recently uh, that they do plan in their near term to start looking for sites to add an, uh, an additional tank out there, whether that be above ground or underground. They do need some storage. Um, we have kind of just verbally agreed that if something comes, as Brian said, we would essentially act as the developer um, to get water across there. It, at a minimum, whenever the interchange goes, which we're all hoping is going to be sooner than later, um, we would punch through before that would occur. So that way we would make sure we would be accommodated the uh, the potential six laning and the reconstructed uh, uh, bridge scenario there. Uh, additionally, I think the sewer, we do have the ability to, as Brian said, to serve four to 500 acres now. I, I will say there's been a lot of interest just in the last couple of weeks. Um, developers are really starting to look for additional ground and they're not, from what I've been told, not having much luck with some of the ground that's on the south side 80 and they're starting to poke around a little bit on the north side. Um, additionally, I, some of you may be aware that the uh, Blunk family farm has officially been listed, which can composed uh, seven parcels east of Middle Road that are generating a lot of attention. Um, I think I've met with five developers in the last 10 days or so, just looking at sewer and wondering what can be done out there. So uh, something, again, as we go into goal setting, that, that's going to need to be discussed again, because we know that's, we do have that ability, but we, we still have a big price tag hanging out there uh, for the, the Spencer Creek lift station. And the Spencer Creek lift station is different than this lift station at, at I-80. Mm -hmm. Correct. So we need to make that distinction. The Spencer Creek lift station was something in the magnitude of $9 million. I think, Brian, we were actually up about 15 yeah. last uh, last cost estimate. Those those numbers just keep going up. Well, if you up. recall, it was one time where we went through with City Council, actually we're looking at uh, punching a pipe through underneath 80, doing a directional bore, and that came in just to put a casing pipe to actually run the sewer underneath Interstate 80 as it exists today, not including if it was ever six lanes, but that was $1.2 million six, seven years ago. So I'm sure that those costs have increased quite a bit. Yeah. Just, Bill, you had a question? Yeah, if, if the need for north of I-80 is going to be for larger than an 8-inch line, isn't it incumbent upon Iowa American Water to punch something bigger through? Yeah, so so they would essentially charge, we would be responsible if, if, we, if we were the ones that initiated it. Ultimately, it depends on, on who is the, the initiator. If, if it's an actual project, then it's a developer and it's their cost. But they're basically saying it, it would be treated as any new development where whoever is initiating that, whether it be the city or a developer, pays for the 8-inch, and then Iowa American pays for anything upcharged from there. I th think it's a 16-inch main that is out there right now out in front of TBK. So at a minimum, it would most likely be at least that size. So they're looking at we'd be better off to wait for a developer to come in to punch that water up there than for us to be the general on it. That is and correct, because if, money. Initiated, if we initiated to punch it through and you, you directed us to go through and, and make that um, initiative, then we would be on the hook for that cost. We just wanted to be able to confirm with I them that the they could do it. The developer gets that rebated back. Do, does the city? We would. Mm -hmm. Yeah, any additional hookups fees, we would get rebated just as they do. Good. Thank you. Just really quick to your honor, I'm sorry. Um, Please. Brent had mentioned the Blunk property for sale on seven parcels. We met with the agent repping the property. They are seven parcels south and north of Forest Grove Road. Certain parcels are west of Criswell. Uh, the Forest Grove School parcel and all points north to I-80 and west of Wells Ferry. And the sale is not likely going to be all seven parcels to one person. So... I think to kind of further Brent's point, we may be working with multiple developers on multiple projects over the course of the next couple of years on what's to develop out there. And currently not very few of those parcels are actually in the city, are they? Uh, correct. I was going to add to that that we've had discussions uh, with Jeff and Chris and I that this might be a good test case for the annexation discussion, specifically the, the parcels that are north of Forest Grove, west of Criswell, that are next to uh, Sterling Woods. Yeah. But the problem there, the fall of the sewer runs again <laughs> to the Another east, direction. not to the west. And our sewer is to the west. Yeah, we just have to see. Ultimately, it would depend on what got built there. 
Right. If it was a larger single development, you might be able to, to accommodate it and tie in to the probably the new Spencer Hollow lift station. More to come. Uh, Jeff put in the vacant commercial property uh, inventory report um, in the report, and I don't know that we have a lot on that, but Jeff, you want to highlight that just for a few seconds? Yeah, my apologies. I'll, I'll try to be quick. So we mentioned this last year. Creating a living document that is up-to-date and regularly maintained is kind of a difficult task because quite often the commercial real estate brokers are reluctant to share their listings and the accompanying information because of their fear of losing you know, their leads, losing their sales, um, losing their commissions. So that's kind of a difficult one to kind of keep a living document on. What I can tell you is we've continued to work with um, developers and property owners and actually established a good relationship with the owner of Duck Creek Plaza. It's a REIT based out of Dallas, Texas. And we're trying to move the needle on Duck Creek Plaza. As we've spoken in the past, there's some existing leases through 23 that make those complex um, discussions. Um, but they're starting to see the end of the, the tunnel and realize that they need to continue to monetize that development. So we continue to work with a local developer and the property owner on a possible Duck Creek Plaza redevelopment. Um, we've worked with uh, the owner of Hobby Lobby on a development opportunity there and helped with a Grayfield tax credit application to the state of Iowa. Um, we hope that that development at Hobby Lobby will help spurn some more development at Duck Creek. I'll have more to come on that in the coming months um, as it's kind of progressing. Cumberland Square, I think, is another one that will probably come up in goal setting as well as Duck Creek. Um, the property owner there suggests that their lease, their vacant leases, excuse me, their vacant spaces are very low. Um, there are a lot of properties there that are currently leased. Some of the tenants may not be as highly desirous as others, but it is pretty well leased out. CVS is the largest space that's available, um, but they're suggesting that they have a tenant um, and they're negotiating the lease terms for that space right now. I'm just not sure who the tenant may be at this time. But in total, they're suggesting that there's only four suites at Cumberland Square that are not that are, that are vacant today. Um, so that's something we're going to continue to monitor and talk about, I'm sure. Downtown vacancies are being heavily marketed by the DBO. Um, the old Champs Trophy is now, as you've probably seen, a state farm agency. Um, some nice new signage has gone up there. The old Action TV down by Tamby Salon is close to being leased or possibly even sold um, to a good new business owner. I'm hoping, hoping that comes through very, very quickly as well. And then the old library across from the community center has been bought. Uh, the real estate developer is putting in a lot of renovation today, and um, he's going to really build up that property as well and do a nice um, multi-mixed-use type of um, building for multiple tenants as well. So that could be a nice little amenity there as well. But downtown availability is growing less and less, which is more and more positive. Yes, sir. And this is a question for anybody that might have an answer. What is happening with Superior Stamps up there? Is that ever going to come down? Mark, the question we've been bantering around over Mark the last couple of weeks. Mark and Steve. Yeah, um, I've been in contact with the owner of the stamp company, who is not the owner of the building. It's a family relationship. They, um, they plan to have it raised in October. They had a dispute with their insurance company. And that dispute has been resolved, and the demo permit is already pulled. They've got the demo contractor selected. October is, is the deadline that they, they gave me. So, Can we force an action on that if they're unwilling to move? We could. I think we can. Yeah, we, we can. So, I mean, that would be a clear nuisance, and we would, yeah. we would take all steps to, to be expeditious in getting that, that taken care of. Would you like the e-building? You can get through. <laughs> Just like the building. Let's get going. Can't believe you turn back. Kim, do you want to close us out <laughs> on the policy agenda with Frozen Landing update? Oh, sure. So Frozen Landing is set to open uh, Thanksgiving week here, that Tuesday of Thanksgiving week. Um, we purchased a new chiller. We've purchased a new gently used Zamboni. Um, so those two items are here. <laughs> well, compared to the use we put the last one through, the if, the, if it's the well. same people that operate it, gently is an operative, is an interesting it's term. It's a smaller model that will help us go around the corners without destroying the boards as much. Um, as so much. we also are keeping the old one because 
I'm told it still runs okay, so we'll keep that as a backup. Um, so we're keeping both. Um, we had to do some electrical upgrades for the new chiller. Um, we're gonna be repairing some of the dasher boards that are not in great shape. Um, some public work staff is gonna help us do some welding and put those back together. But all systems go, Casey's been up there checking out the lights and making sure um, we're good to go for Thanksgiving week opening. Fantastic. So with that, Your so Honor, include our strategic plan. Yeah, well, it, it gives you the policy agenda update, and then you have do. the report here has all the other items from the management agenda and the management and progress on the back and the major projects. Um, you don't need to study this now, but I do want you to study it between now and goal setting to make sure that everything that we hit has an update for you. I think it's uh, everybody did a great job of putting it all together. So um, with that, unless you have other questions, I think we have another uh, duty to uh, go to. Very, Greg. Greg. Very quick. Uh, I'd like to see the uh, evaluation of the city administrator and city attorney as an item, the redone one that we had been talking about. A different format. A different whatever, yeah. As part of goal side. Yes. Okay. And then um, the flood buyout, where is real quick, is that? That's in this report for management. It is but, in there? Okay, I yep, can look. But I go can look right at ahead it. if you want. That's okay. Mark, I briefly, because we're going to talk about okay. direction at goal set. <clears throat> right. Yes, thank you, Your Honor. We have 11 homes out of 22 purchased and torn down. We have one that's um, in closing essentially shortly, and then we torn down. Um, so we're about halfway done. We anticipate to finish within a year, which will be ahead of our grant schedule. Um, and then we also are working on an application for a third round to try and score off that area that we talked about um, to try and provide so, uh, an assemblage of properties that could be used as a park or open space. Okay. Thank you. Awesome. Anything <coughs> else? <coughs> Frank. I'd just like to thank uh, Public Works and anybody else involved for getting that speed limit on Forest Grove Road extended a little further from the school to include the park. I think that's gonna be great and uh, reduce the possibility of maybe some injuries in that area because there's a lot of people crossing the road there to get to the park out of the neighborhood. And uh, I had put a request in and it's happened. I just wanted to say thank you. Scott. I didn't have a question, but with that said, any idea on when the bridge will be done on Indiana? Yeah, very shortly. Brent just met it with looked, the contractor. Yeah, they're really close. I think about two and a half, three weeks, yep. they said. Wow. That'll help. Brent, Brent do you want to give um, them an update as well on, on the, the paved surface of Indiana and what we might be talking about come goal setting? It, yeah, real quick. Um, with the bridge being closed, we've kind of got a unique opportunity in our seal coat program. So we had a contractor out there. We know that the, the uh, majority of Indiana between middle and uh, Wells Ferry has really struggled the last two years. We we had some success with what we did two and a half years ago, and it's it's just not holding. There's too much oil out there. So we're trying a couple of different surface treatments uh, at the end of this year to try to seal it up by us a couple of years. But uh, we will be coming forward in, in CFP discussions, and we're going to talk about this next week with Decker and Jason, um, uh, potentially looking at doing some short-term um, full-depth reclamation maybe being added. What's what we did on Forest Grove three years ago east of – of middle road where we utilized the seal coat material there and ended up capping it just because I don't think we're going to be able to wait for on both Indiana and possibly in Criswell, um, for federal money. Uh, and these are really actually cost effective. It wouldn't be widening, but we'd be getting a, a good solid asphalt, um, driving surface. So something that we'll be potentially discussing come, come budget sessions. And you know, we'd love to, to wait and try to, to leverage the federal dollars, but, those are large projects that we can do something interim to, to get us by because the traffic out there is getting pretty heavy. Thank you. Any other questions? All right, seeing none, I'd like to entertain a motion to adjourn tonight's meeting. Okay. We stand adjourned. Good work, people. Thank you to the department heads for...